Hello, very good afternoon to all of you. I thank you all for coming to the talk. Today's talk is by Professor Sunil Manning and Chitandam Ayer. Both names uh, need no introduction at all. Professor Mani is the director of the CDS and Chitambran is associate professor. They are very familiar name, names to this audience. But I want to say a little bit about uh, the very interesting topic they have chosen to do research and present their research findings on, which is digital payments in India. This topic is of a great um, research interest from public policy viewpoint. In India, monetary policy uh, regulator, RBI, and the fiscal policy controllers government are very keen that uh, the country, Indians switch over to digital payment. And the private sector is also very keen. You, I'm sure you have seen cashback schemes uh, trying to allure you to use uh, digital payment to make transaction and your friends talking about how they got uh, so, and, so all this all these are illustrations of uh, <laughs> authority fiscal authorities trying to to nudge people into switching over to digital currency and digital payments uh, di uh, and, and more recently, the finance minister also announced the digital rupee. It's also part of that uh, grand scheme of things. Digital payments uh, in turn are part of our, are an important pivot in the digital economy. Market valuations enjoyed by fintechs, startups, up and listed companies that tend to specialize or invest in uh, digital economy and its dimensions amply reflect the great uh, great hope or expectations that people have placed, investors have placed in digital currency, digital payment, and digital economy broadly. To give you a sense of uh, how important this issue is, uh, that the market valuation enjoyed by one of top tech joints, you know, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, you choose any of those and the market value valuation enjoyed by them is five times of Airbus and Boeing combined. Airbus and Boeing combined, they, they control, they supply 80% of world aircrafts. But when it comes to market valuation together, they do not even add up to one fourth, one fifth of uh, market valuation enjoyed by Amazon or the Google, for instance. So that's the, uh, so, so that gives us some idea of importance of uh, the topic. I will not uh, take much more time. I look forward to hearing from the authors on uh, what they have to say about Indian experiment or in the effect of Indian policies at times by design, at times by accident. The, the how those policies have affected adoption of digital payments in India. Uh, over to you. Uh, I, what I understand, Professor Mani will start first, and then uh, Chitambran will come in to complete the presentation. After pre their presentation, uh, we will take uh, floor will be opened for question answers. In the meantime, if you would like, you can type your answers in the chat box or in Q&A. You can use Q&A feature to send your questions. Over to you, Professor Mani. Okay. First of all, uh, thank uh, Professor Ram Singh for uh, sparing his valuable time in moderating this discussion. Our uh, paper, which is written joint with uh, um, uh, Chinabram Iyer, is titled Dig Diffusion of uh, Digital Payments in India During the Last uh, Decade of 2011-12 until 2021, uh, 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 the fiscal year ending 2021. And basically what we are trying to do here is to looking at a new technology like digital payments compared to old technology, which is use of uh, uh, cash for uh, making payments. And uh, the way in which it has uh, diffused in the economy as a whole over this uh, last one decade. And uh, the basic point that we try to present is that while we are talking about diffusion of any new technologies, 
uh, we need to consider the sectoral system of innovation for that particular technology. Sectoral system of innovation is consists of a number of institutions or actors, and also it consists of the technology domain in that particular uh, sector, and also the demand. These are the three building blocks of a sectoral system of innovation, and these will have to uh, be pulled together to have a sustained increase in the uh, diffusion of that generation and dif indeed diffusion of that uh, new technology. Now, what is very often uh, confused is that uh, you have temporary shocks which are applied at different points in time, and this temporary shocks can be deliberate actions on the part of the government, either on the part of the fiscal authority or the monetary authority, or in the form of a random event, just like the pandemic, for instance, uh, which could also drive uh, uh, various kinds of new innovations. But our argument is that these uh, uh, temporary shocks which are applied do not explain the long-term trends in diffusion, but rather it is explained by the sectoral system of innovation of uh, uh, that particular technology. And we take digital transactions as a, uh, as a case in point, and this could be applied to any other new technologies also, we would argue. Uh, but uh, we are taking the digital transactions because it has assumed great importance in our country. And as you can see, in, even in the budget that was presented just yesterday, there were a large number of uh, policy measures uh, which were enunciated to drive digital transactions. So I will first share my slide. The way we are going to do, as um, Professor Ram Singh has said, is that I will do the presentation up to a point where I will explain the rate of growth of uh, uh, or diffusion of uh, digital payments in the country. And then Chidambaram will take over from me and he will uh, go into the, the building blocks of the sector system of innovation and, uh, and then try to explain the uh, uh, observed trends that we have presented. So I'm going to share my slides now. So just give me a few minutes. Uh, can you see the slides now? Not yet. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So I will start with the, the presentation is going to be structured as follows. I'll start with the motivation for writing this paper. Then we will go on to the research questions and the problem that we are analyzing. Then we will have a brief engagement with the past literature on the topic. And uh, then we will elucidate the analytical framework that we have used to answer the two research questions that we have raised. Then we will measure and present the rate of diffusion of digital payments. And, uh, and then we will go on to explaining the rate of diffusion in terms of the sectoral system of innovation of digital payment. This is what Chidambaram is going to do. And then we will conclude the presentation. So let me start with the motivation. <coughs> Now, there has been, as I was just telling you before, there has been a tremendous push for digital payments by both monetary and fiscal authorities in the recent past. For instance, uh, the monetary authority as represented by the Reserve Bank of India had designated the, uh, the decade 2010 to 20 as the digital payments decade. And a number of things have been uh, done, uh, for instance, to improve both institutions and technologies uh, which support digital payments. For instance, uh, if you uh, uh, if you look at 2010, you had only a few instruments or channels through which uh, uh, you could uh, do the digital payments. And but in 2020, you have a plethora of uh, institute uh, instruments which you can use for uh, uh, driving digital payments. But the strange thing uh, that has happened is that when you take the total amount of transactions which are taking place in the economy. Um, uh, this is estimated by World Pay in its global payment report, uh, and 72% of the total transactions which are taking place in the economy, even as late as uh, almost the end of the so-called decade, decade of uh, digital payments, is still cash-based, and it is the highest among the BRICS countries. For instance, uh, uh, in in, uh, in China, it is only 21 cash accounts, only for 21% of the total transactions. And uh, uh, in uh, uh, Brazil, for instance, it is only 52, and Russia is 60, and South Africa is 57, but India is still 72. So how is that, with so much of push by the monetary authorities, uh, they, cash is still the king in terms of uh, transactions, and this is what we are trying to explain uh, by invoking the sectoral system of innovation. 
Now coming to the fiscal authorities, the uh, the uh, the in the budget itself, we have had a number of policies which have been enunciated from time to time. For instance, if you look at the budget of uh, last year, 2021-22, uh, about 1,500 crores was basically set up essentially to provide financial support for improving the ecosystem for digital payments. And out of this 1,500 crores, about 1,300 crores were basically for improving retail digital payments. And and uh, and uh, although uh, uh, when you look at the budget, you see that uh, this policy has not been really implemented, and that's why in the latest budget that was presented yesterday, the finance minister is continuing this uh, fiscal incentive for this year as well. And so you can see, uh, and also you have uh, uh, various other kinds of uh, incentives which are put in place. For instance, um, companies which have a turnover of about one crore earlier had to do a you know, compulsory auditing of their uh, of of their uh, accounts. This was raised in the last budget to five crores initially, and then to ten crores. Uh, so thres thre the the threshold level of uh, uh, you know when accounting uh, uh, you know kicks in is about thre about ten crores, and that was introduced uh, also in the last budget. Okay, so can. Uh, provided those companies conduct 95% of their transactions in terms of digital payments. So you have a huge push from uh, both the monetary authority as well as from the fiscal authority. Now, coming back to the monetary authority, I must say that the, uh, uh, the push for this started even slightly before the start of this uh, so-called decade. It started in the year 2007, with the RBI passing the Payment and Settlement Act of 2007. And uh, this is a, a legal instrument for facilitating uh, digital payments. And in fact, India is one of the few countries which is having actually a legal instrument for facilitating uh, 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 digital payments. Many countries do not have this kind of a legal instrument. And under that, you can see that by 2010, you have the National Payments Corporation of India was uh, established by the RBI. And a number of new technologies have been uh, re released. For instance, in 2016, they came out with this uni uh, 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 unified payment interface or UPI, which has now become a very a major uh, mode through which uh, uh, digital payments are uh, uh, channelized. Now, you also have uh, uh, during this period two shocks, which have in, uh, which should have increased the uh, likelihood of diffusion of digital payments. First one is the demonetization of 2016-17. Very often in the literature, as we will, when we look at, when we confront the existing literature on digital payments, uh, uh, most of the, almost the entire literature has actually uh, take, uh, taken this as the start, starting point for the digital payments, while this is simply not correct at all. It started way back in uh, 2007 and it became much more strong from 2010 onwards, okay? And uh, uh, so demonetization was basically a temporary shock, and perhaps that would have uh, had a positive effect on some of the building blocks of the second system of innovation, which Deborah will talk about in great detail later on. And uh, then, of course, you have the pandemic uh, period since March 2020, which is, of course, continuing even now, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, this also would have actually promoted, supposed to have promoted digital payments with its requirement for uh, social distancing, contacts, contactless payments, people sitting at home, doing a lot of online transactions, and then using digital uh, modes of payment for uh, financing those uh, more, uh, uh, online transactions, etc. Okay, so you have this uh, two uh, uh, shocks that were also applied uh, during the course of the time. Then, of course, you have a recent study by the National Payments Corporation of India, which has uh, uh, surveyed up, uh, apparently about 5,300 households in 25 states of the country in year 2020. And uh, uh, they divided these households into three categories, the bottom 40%, the middle 40%, and the top 20% in terms of their income levels. Although the Threshold levels for dividing this is not clearly specified in the published report, which is available on the NPCI. And this report claims that across the three, sex, uh, three size classes of uh, uh, in, you know, households, uh, you find that almost like 30% of the households have actually adopted some form of uh, uh, digital payments or other uh, by, by year 2020. Okay. 
Then, of course, the concept of digital currency is gaining currency, not just in India, but also across the world. There is this very important book, which has been rated as one of the best uh, book in economics or business by the Economist magazine and Financial Times, which is the future of money, how digital revolution is transforming currency and finance by Ishwa Prasad. Okay, we have this book in our library, for instance, and uh, um, and this also talks about that the future of uh, the, uh, the future of money is in the form of digital current currency. And as we can see that government of India has already established uh, the, the, the government has already going to introduce a digital rupee in the uh, in the forthcoming fiscal year itself. Then, of course, uh, the government also has been in the pro process of setting up exclusive digital banks. In fact, according to the latest budget, the the uh, 75 uh, uh, digital banking units have been, is going to be set up by the existing scheduled commercial banks in 75 districts, and also exclusive digital banks are also going to take uh, to to come into place. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that future of transactions in India uh, uh, is likely to be in the area of uh, digital transaction uh, is going to be digital, and so it's extremely important to see how well the digital payments are. Uh, diffusing within the economy, what are the impediments to it, and, and how this can be overcome. So that's basically the motivation for our uh, study. And then we have two re uh, 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 research questions. Given the tremendous improvements in institutions and policies, and as I said, almost every day, some new institution or policy or a new technology is being introduced, essentially to service this uh, digital transactions. And uh, and of course, we occasionally we have uh, shocks also being applied. You know, uh, for instance, the demonetization removed uh, almost like 86% uh, of uh, specified bank notes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, specified bank notes which accounted for about 86% of the uh, transactions, and so that forced people to uh, re take recourse to digital means of payment. Then, of course, the pandemic also has uh, uh, encouraged people to move to. Uh, digital payments, but what has been happening to the rate of division of digital payments? Because a lot of the conversation which is taking place uh, on on uh, you know the rate of diffusion is uh, I'm afraid uh, or we are afraid is in terms of uh, the volume of transactions and uh, uh, and sometimes they pick up specific modes of uh, uh, digital payment transactions, for instance, uh, you know, uh, the unified payment interface and how fast that is diffusing. In fact, what we, we will present data to show that it is just uh, is just not the case. Uh, in fact, what we are going to present is a counterintuitive result, uh, namely that uh, the rate of growth of uh, digital payments in India has actually been falling and it has even become negative in during the last two years, which is actually quite counterintuitive. So it will require a fair amount of persuasion on our part to persuade you to believe uh, that this is indeed the case. And we are using only the data from the Reserve Bank of India and from official sources. We have not used any kind of private sources of data uh, or, or any service of uh, a questionable nature. Okay. And then once we have established that, how does one explain this rate of diffusion? Can you explain this purely in terms of uh, these temporary shocks, which is which seems to be the preoccupation with the literature, because almost the entire literature, which is available as far as India is concerned, is preoccupied with trying to relate the rate of diffusion of uh, uh, digital payments with the temporary shocks. But what we tend to argue is that it's much more uh, uh, fundamental in the sense that you do have to invoke the contribution played by what we call the sectoral system of innovation. And as I said before, it consists of these three building blocks of actors and institutions and their networks, and of course, the technology domain and of course, the demand. So the research problem that we have in place is diffusion of digital payments in the economy is basically a function of the sectoral system of innovation and not due to the temporary shocks. You know, the, uh, the sectoral system of innovation consists of these three building blocks. Again, I'm repeating here, actors and institutions will come. Uh, Chidambaram will spell out who are these actors and institutions and the technology and knowledge domain of that sector. And finally, the demand for that innovations. In fact, demand is an extremely important. Demand for new innovations is an extremely important one. And that's one of the reasons why some countries are much more innovative than others, because the consumers in those countries are venturesome. And they are willing to demand 
uh, you know, and any kind of new innovation. So that's one of the reasons as to why, for instance, despite all the other things that has happened in Asian countries, United States continues continues to be one of the most uh, innovative countries in the world. So if you look at any major innov industrial innovation which have come up uh, in the recent past, they have all originated from the United States. And essentially because the demand, uh, the, the, the United States plays a very uh, strong emphasis on driving demand. And in fact, uh, you can see that during the pandemic period also, they were placing money in dollars into the accounts of every single uh, you know, individual in that country and thereby driving demand and people demanding more, uh, you know, more products, et cetera, and that driving innovations and also economic growth in general, et cetera, and so on. So temporary shocks applied to enhance data usage of digital payments can only have a short term effect in diffusing digital payments. So this is the research problem that we seek to analyze in, in fact, somewhat quantitatively as well uh, uh, later on. Now, if you look at uh, a brief engagement with the literature on uh, on uh, di on uh, diffusion of digital payments, they can be broadly classified into world literature and India specific literature. And I will, uh, in our paper, we have a, a, a systematic discussion of the world literature, but I will focus essentially on the India specific literature because that's much is more relevant for us. Now, here there are two issues which are considered. One issue is demonetization per se, and uh, uh, where people have been, uh, analysts have been very much concerned with what, uh, you know, how did the demonetization occur and what does its uh, actual and potential effect on the economy, et cetera, and so on. So you have this uh, book by uh, uh, Avron Ram Reddy in 2007-17, and then of course you have uh, uh, the book by uh, J.T. Ghosh, uh, C.P. Chand Shekhar, and Prabhat Patnaik. Okay, but they analyzed basically demonetization per se. Then you have the second issue. We have three important papers which have been published in some of the leading journals in economics. So you have the the Chodro Rake et al. Uh, paper, uh, and Chodro Rake uh, along with Gita Gopinath, uh, Prachi Misra, and uh, uh, and uh, 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 and Narayanan, uh, who has published this paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in year two thousand. 20, okay, and their paper is basically concerned with, uh, uh, you know, they look at a very detailed district level survey of uh, uh, of uh, the effect of demonetization on digital payments, and they find that those districts having a cash shortage adopt digital payments faster, but they again were very careful in stating that this uh, effect of a digital payment, I'm sorry, demonetization on digital payments is at best short short term. And we find the same kind of results in uh, Prusse et al., uh, which is a Northwestern University paper, and also the one paper by Amartya Lakini, which was published in the Journal of Economic Perspective in the India Symposium in year 2020. Now, the Amartya Lakini paper is very important, interesting, because he states very clearly that demonetization appeared to have a positive, but although a muted permanent increase in the degree of uh, the digitization of the economy. These conclusions, though, should be viewed as tentative, given that we only have three years of data after uh, uh, post demonetization. So, um, what you basically have is uh, uh, that the existing literature has focused essentially on looking at the effect of demonetization on the tendency of people to adopt this new innovation in the form of digital payments. Okay, so it has not really worked out the uh, longitudinal analysis of how digital payments have been diffusing within the economy. And so that is basically the kind of uh, 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 gap in the literature which Chidambaram and myself are attempting to, uh, to fulfill. Now, the uh, analytical framework that we uh, propose, uh, we have these two research questions. For the first, the rate of diffusion, because when you talk about the diffusion of any new technologies, Typically, we have, first of all, the rate of diffusion worked out. And this the rate of diffusion we typically have on the numerator, uh, the number of people who have, or, or households or agents who have adopted that new innovation. And in the denominator, we take the number of uh, 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 you know, agents who could have adopted that innovation. And if that's increasing over time, then we would say that the new technology is actually diffusing. 
Unfortunately, in the case of digital payments, we do not have that kind of a uh, detailed information, uh, uh, you know, across households because if we are the agents here are basically households and institutions and uh, and firms, etc., and so on. And and uh, so we don't have this kind of an information uh, about how many of these people have actually adopted uh, the uh, the rate of uh, I'm sorry uh, uh, digital means of payments. So the way in which we are going to look at this is basically we look at the rate of growth of digital payments both in volume and value terms. And luckily for us, this has been of uh, uh, you know uh, compiled by the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, now on a daily basis and a few years ago on a monthly basis. And so you have uh, the data at uh, uh, annual level, uh, monthly basis, and also at the daily uh, daily basis, we have uh, data on uh, uh, both the volume and value of uh, transactions, not only at the aggregate level, but also at individual digital uh, payment uh, instrument wise. Okay. Then we also develop a kind of an index of digital payments and we uh, and we uh, compare uh, and this index of digital payments which i will explain to you a little later and we compare this digital payments with the old technology which is uh, an index of currency in circulation so ideally speaking what we should get is this digital payments index going up over a period of time because uh, if the technology is diffusing very widely the digital payments index should be increasing over a period of time and the index for currency in circulation should be going down OK, so that should be the kind of a, a, an ideal picture. But against an ideal picture, we will see what is actually the real picture, which is based on the Indian data. Now, in terms of the factors explaining diffusion of digital payments for want of for uh, for uh, risk of repetition, uh, I've already mentioned that the second system of innovation is broken up into its building blocks, actors and networks, technology domain and demand. And Chidambaram will go into the details of each of these three, and then he will put it together, and then see uh, uh, and how we can explain uh, the uh, the measured uh, rate of diffusion that we have ob obtained. Okay, so now let me first go and present the data on the rate of uh, 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 diffusion of digital payments. I start with uh, just giving you a, a flair of the type of digital payments that we have. We started with bank cards of all kinds, debit, credit cash, travel cards, etc. And uh, uh, about 751 banks is now offering these kinds of uh, cards. Then you have what's called unstructured supplementary services, which are essentially meant for uh, feature phones. 51 banks have actually adopted this. And then you have other enabled uh, payment services, uh, which about 138 banks have adopted this. Then, of course, the most important one of unified payment interface, which uh, at the moment about 282 banks. This was introduced in the year 2016. And at that time, there were only 21 banks which were giving universal unified payment interface. And uh, and and uh, most of you would be using this because you will be using a third party app essentially to use this. So things like Google Pay, phone pay or all these sort of things come under this UPI and and uh, uh, and about 282 banks are actually off offering this. Then, of course, you have mobile banks and then, of course, you have uh, Internet and mobile banking, which all banks are actually offering. So these are the kind of typically the digital payments that we are using. Now, in terms of periodization, because we are talking about a long period of about 10 years. And uh, so when we talk about this uh, periodization, I think it is important to make uh, a one point very clear that uh, the Reserve Bank of India had changed the definition of what is a digital payment in 2017-18, post-2017-18 onwards. So up to 2017-18, 2016-17, it was using one kind of definition. And, and the main difference between the two periods is basically the fact that paper clearing and, uh, and, and CCIL operated systems uh, were, uh, were, uh, and, and, uh, were are not included as digital payments post 2017-18. So you have a truncation of the data series, which ca causes a little bit of a, a problem. But, uh, uh, you know, and, and so uh, we do have a, a slight problem of uh, 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 in talking about the long uh, period. So if you take the 2011-12 to 2020-21 period, uh, what we have is basically a truncation of the series. And uh, we uh, here, the blue line actually gives you both the uh, 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 volume of uh, digital payments transactions in the economy as a whole, the rate of growth of that each year, annual percentage changes each year, 
okay, in uh, in volume terms or uh, volume terms that's given in the uh, blue line, and the red line actually gives you the annual percentage changes in value of digital transactions. Uh, you know, in both the periods, okay, and what you find is uh, there is, as you can see, there is a temporary increase in the. Uh, both the volume and value of transactions in 2016-17, essentially due to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, demonetization. In fact, uh, 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 there is a big increase in value according to the old definition, in almost like 64% increase during that period. But it had also it had already increased to 69% before that also. So from that point of view, even to argue that the demonetization is the only thing that has increased. Uh, the volume of uh, transactions, even in 2016-17, the data doesn't bear out. Okay, and but what is more interesting is that the value of such transactions have started plummeting, and it had to even become negative during 2019-20 and 2021. When uh, during the and you you know it, especially the 2021 is the pandemic uh, year, uh, pandemic period. 1920 is not really the pandemic period because there is only one month. Which is March 2020, which you normally consider as a pandemic month. Okay, and uh, so the basically what you find is that the rate of growth of digital payments, contrary to normal understanding, has been going down. Okay, going down over uh, uh, both uh, in volume and value terms, and in value terms, it has even become negative in the last uh, uh, two years. And uh, uh, so, uh, and that's quite surprising, you know. And this becomes more ev uh, more uh, evident when we uh, actually classify them into these periods. For instance, if I take the average during the pre-demonetization period, of course, the two uh, periods are not very strictly comparable. But nevertheless, uh, and you know, uh, the pre-demonetization period and average the, in volume terms, uh, the digital payments have increased by forty four point eight percent on an average, okay, uh, 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 per year. In value terms, it was only about 14.6%. During the demonetization period, it suddenly jumped to 64% and to 26%. Then again, came down to 44.7% uh, during the post demonetization period. Uh, and uh, so, in other words, the volume of even the volume of uh, rate of growth of uh, uh, digital payments have been exactly the same pre and post uh, demonetization. And in terms of value, it has uh, is significantly declined. You don't have to do any kind of statistical test to show that there is a significant decline in uh, the value of digital payments. Now, uh, uh, this might, uh, uh, you know, uh, come in contradiction to something which the RBA has put in place because the RBA has also, since March 2018, has designed an index of digital payments called the RBI Digital Payments Indicator. Okay. Uh, with March 2018 as the base year for that uh, index. Now, when you look at the, uh, there, is, there, is not, there is not a whole lot of information about how this index is constructed, but we do have some information about the weights that are assigned to the, so it's a composite index. It consists of those factors which enable dis digital payments to take place and also digital payments performance also, and, and, uh, and also consumer centricity, etc., which is a qualitative consumer's awareness of uh, uh, the education in initiatives, informational problems, etc., and so on. Uh, of uh, of. Uh, uh, please, please keep muted. muted. Okay, uh, of of uh, digital payments, and and so, uh, but when you look at the in, in this index, what you find is that. Uh, only 45% of the weight is assigned to payment per se. The rest is assigned to payment enablers and infrastructure, all of which have actually been in increasing in an exponential fashion. For instance, the number of internet users, the number of mobile users, other numbers, bank accounts, and so on. So all these things have been increasing in a, in a, in a, in a very exponential fashion. So naturally, this index actually shows a, a, a increase. So uh, the, the, the two difficulties are, first of all, the RBI is giving more weightage to enablers than and payment performance itself. And, uh, and some of the uh, uh, enablers, like for instance, consumer centricity, et cetera, suffer from measure measurement errors, as these are not regularly collected by any official statistical agencies in the country. 
Okay, so I'm not sure about that. You have this information collected on a monthly basis. We don't have anything uh, available at all. Now, this blue line actually shows the value of this index over a period of time uh, until September of 2021, which is the latest year for which you have this uh, 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 index available. But the red line actually shows the rate of growth of this index over a period of time, and the rate of growth actually shows a decline or at best a tremendous fluctuation. In, in any case, the index has actually not been secularly increasing as it is claimed. So we have we go into our own index of digital payments, which is defined as uh, intensity of digital payments. So we take digital payments, total digital payments as estimated by RBI on the numerator, and then we divide that by the GDP. In, uh, both are in current prices. Uh, and so we convert that into an intensity figure, and then we convert this intensity figure into an index by taking 2016-17 as the base year. Similarly, we do a similar thing for uh, index of currency in circulation as well. Okay, and then we chart these two indices here. Okay, so please remember the ideal picture that I talked to you about uh, before. If digital payments are indeed going up, what you should see is that the digital payment, the pay, index of digital payments should be increasing and the index of currency in circulation should be coming down. On the other hand, what you find is that the index of digital payments is actually going down and the index of currency in circulation is actually going up. And what is more interesting is that index of currency in circulation has gone back to even pre demonetization levels. In fact, even high, slightly higher than the pre demonetization levels. Now, uh, and this is what the World Pay report was also saying that people are uh, gone back to using cash as a dominant mode of uh, transactions, even now, and which which is uh, not a good news for uh, uh, the diffusion rate. So, which means that uh, uh, the summing up uh, in terms of the diffusion rates, uh, our uh, uh, you know uh, findings actually corroborate our earlier finding that the growth of digital payments has been declining while currency in circulation is back to demonetization. What is even more surprising is that digital payments have even declined in 2020-21, the pandemic year, with restricted movement, lock, uh, lockdowns, and increased online purchases. One would have expected consumers to use digital forms of payment, especially when most of these are contactless. In fact, I have seen also a recent study which actually showed that a lot of the e uh, e commerce transactions are based on. Uh, you know, are also cash fixed, uh, cash on arrival uh, kind of uh, uh, transactions. Can that person uh, uh, mute? Can you please uh, all be muted, please? Please. Okay. Okay. So this decline. Uh, uh, so what we will uh, argue is that this decline can be due to macroeconomic factors because of the overall growth of the growth performance of the economy, you know, and the extent of financial inclusion and specific factors that impact on digital payments, like the availability of fiscal infrastructure to effect of digital payments on financial literacy, etc. In other words, the sectoral system of innovation of digital payments. The fact that the economy has been on a downward trend since 2017-18 and, uh, and it was in the negative territory in 2020-21 is now fairly well established. So that also would have had a kind of a deleterious effect in uh, on digital payments. So economic activity level impact clearly supersedes the technology substitution effect. And we will pick up this point again after uh, uh, Chidamkram presents his uh, data. Now, uh, towards the, uh, 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 we look at the composition of digital payments. And what we find is that Almost the entire digital payments is driven by uh, large uh, valued transactions like RTGS, real time growth settlements, which are basically transactions uh, between persons when the transaction amount is about rupees two lakhs. Okay, so that's all. That was something like 87.54%. It has come down to about 75%, but still it's about 75% in terms of value. Okay. And in terms of uh, 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 volume terms, the most important one right now is UPI, Uni Unified Payment Interface, which accounts for about 51% of the transactions, but it is only about 2.9% of the value. So even if it is going up leaps and bounds, it's unlikely to drive digital payments because its effect on uh, uh, digital payments is extremely small. Okay, and it is RTGS and uh, NEFT, for instance, which is again uh, another 17.76%, uh, 
uh, uh, which is actually driving uh, uh, digital payments. So you can see that this is basically, uh, uh, you know, large valued uh, transactions. So if you took at RTGS, even RTGS has actually declined during this period. Okay, both in uh, volume and value terms. NEFT has also declined, and various types of card payments, which is debit and credit card uh, payments, also have declined. Uh, uh, you know, uh, significantly uh, during this period. Now you take the celebrated uni uni uh, um, unified payment interface. This was reported in the latest economic survey, which was presented two days ago. And this table is act this uh, this uh, data is actually uh, sourced from the table 3.6 of the economic survey, uh, which was presented two days ago. And you can see, uh, and it gives both the value and volume of you know, uh, UPI payments. And it shows that uh, it has also plummeted. Both the volume and value has also plummeted quite severely uh, uh, in, in the post uh, demonetization uh, period. Okay. So, in other words, uh, 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 the, our first objective is uh, the rate of growth of digital payments uh, seems to have actually uh, uh, come down, which is actually pretty counterintuitive. And, uh, uh, and it, it is also driven by large value. Uh, transactions like RTGS and NEFT, etc., and UPI, of course, only in volume terms. But volume terms doesn't make any difference because ultimately, when you are talking about diffusion, it is diffusion with respect to uh, uh, value. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with reference to the total value of uh, uh, of uh, goods and services produced, how much of that is uh, based on digital transactions? So that has actually been going down. So I think now I pass on the. Uh, Better to to uh, Chinnabram uh, to do the sec uh, to the to present the explanation in terms of the sector system of innovation. Thank you, Professor Mani. Um, I just share my screen. Yes. 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 Uh, as uh, as Professor Mani mentioned uh, in, the, in, this, in the the second part of our analytical framework, where, where we uh, look for the factors uh, respond. So, is the screen visible? It is visible. Thank you. It is. Thank you. So, so in the second part of the analytical framework, wherein we look out for factors responsible for the digital payments, and we are using the sector system of innovation framework. To understand the factors responsible for the digital payments uh, diffusion in this country, uh, and uh, we have already outlined the three main building blocks. So we focus uh, the first uh, key building block, which is the actors and networks. And in the actors and networks, the most important and the prime mover has been the Reserve Bank of India, which has built uh, the institutions as well as the networks for the digital payment a payment ecosystem in this country. For example, uh, one of the first steps. Uh, that uh, it, uh, you know, it took was in 1996 when it set up the Institute for Development and Research in Banking Technology (IDRBT) uh, to focus uh, on developing and managing the IT uh, infrastructure for banking and financial sectors. As a matter of fact, most you know IDRBT developed many technological systems, which are still today the backbone around which the payment settlement systems in India rally. So in that sense, uh, the technology developed by IDRBT has is being is being used in the digital payment ecosystem today. Another step that RBI took was in 2001, it uh, created a the, the Clearing Corporation of India, a finance market infrastructure that operates various payment systems, particularly the money, the government securities, uh, forex, and derivative markets. Uh, in 2007, as Professor Mani mentioned, the Payment and Settlement Systems Act uh, of uh, was was passed uh, as per which the RBI was the designated as the statutory regulatory authority for the payment and settlement systems in the country. And as Professor Mani mentioned, India is one of the few countries to have such a uh, framework. Immediately after 2007, in 2008, uh, RBI created the NPCI, the National Payments Corporation of India, which is an umbrella organization uh, for all the retail payment systems in the country. And it was uh, in a, the instituted with an objective of optimally using the resources through consolidation of existing infrastructure and building new infrastructure to enable uh, diffusion of digital payments across the country in a seamless manner. 
another credit to rbi that one should say has been its you know technological neutral stance in its regulatory approach for example the rbi has tried to develop a digital ecosystem so that a variety of technologies can develop and uh, the ecosystem allows adoption of all such technologies and the competition is ensured among the technologies which obviously will benefit the ecosystem uh, rbi also was very careful in initially developing the ecosystem by primarily focusing on a bank led kind of ecosystem but over a period of time it slowly but surely included the non bank uh, actors to widen the scope and increase the outreach of the ecosystem what this uh, strategy ensured was that you know the length and depth of actors have been considerably enhanced during this decade so rbi's contribution to the digital payment ecosystem has been phenomenal and it's been a prime mover another important network which the rbi helped create was the bank network uh, uh, like we now have a wide bank network rbi facilitated the establishment of a very wide bank network from 72000 in 2006 to almost 150000 in 2021 so what this wide bank network also helped in was uh, as far as possible give easy access for those who want a bank account and a bank account as we all understand is one of the key requirements for digital payments however uh, bank uh, bank account is not universal in this country because as per 2011 census only 58.7% of the households in the country are availing banking services rural households are probably not as well connected uh, to the bank network because as per the nss 59th round all in that debt and investment survey uh, 51.4 of the farmer households are financially excluded from formal and informal sources so there is some amount of work that has to be done with respect to the rural uh, network uh, even rbi in its recent uh, index on financial inclusion uh, which it has developed shows that it has uh, only steadily increased from 43.4 in march 2017 to 53.9 in march 2021 or in other words there is scope for further financial inclusion or there is scope for more people to have bank accounts yeah, i'm sure most of us have heard about the pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana where in bank accounts were created this increased the number of bank accounts from 12.55 crores in 2015 to 43.5 crores by the end of september 2021 what this helped this particular this pm jd by bank accounts help was helped in uh, helped in digital transfer of government transfers so the, all the government transfers were done digitally to this accounts which obviously helped in the definition of digital payments and a wide bank account uh, bank network facilitated access to the uh, creation of new accounts which also implies that the rtgf neft and imps tran- transaction directly benefited uh, from the bank accounts that were created due to this bank network expansion so in that sense the bank network helped another important actor in the system is the, uh, are the payment system operators rbi has authorized other numerous payment system operators to operate under the payment uh, and settlement systems act the clearing the ccil and npci are two such important public sector stakeholders for the card payment network we are we all use a debit card credit card there are five such payers whereas for the prepaid instruments uh, under which most of the upi and uh, the mobile wallets come there are around 38 players most of whom entered in 2017 this is was this is exactly what i mentioned when i said that rbi also encourage non banking actors and which we have seen the the paytm and uh, google have now help you in transferring your money so in that sense uh, rbi played a critical role in getting the uh, institutions and networks right so in that this, in that case this building block has been very instrumental for this sector system of innovation the the second uh, important building block is the technology and knowledge domain here one has to make a distinction about the software and the hardware part of it software is primarily as we all understand we are quite strong in software and uh, we have we have our strengths in that but before i get into that what's also uh, key to remember is that the technology neutrality regulatory stand of rbi as i mentioned before has enabled the digital ecosystem to develop and adopt a variety of technologies as a result of which a variety of systems are there in place in this country for example Uh, we can send money through neft that is electronic means through bank network we can also send money both through the ussd which is the which is for feature phones or the upi can based kind of features of uh, mobile phone based features the software has been developed here so in that sense uh, we we have our, our software systems that the way we have developed has enabled us to uh, send money across various platforms even the aadhar uh, there are many people in remote areas who receive money 
just based on other identification, the banking correspondent comes and they have a machine by which by through AEPS, they are able to receive their money. So in that case also, the software implementation has been phenomenal. We have also come up, you know, come up uh, brought up a software system wherein you can have electronic toll collection. The NETC also is another uh, this system developed, especially the software, but wherein toll is now seamlessly collected, collected across all the toll booths, uh, road toll booths uh, across the country. So in that sense, we have been quite strong. Uh, one of the, the public sector organization, that is the NPCI, has been you know at the forefront of this. So here in this graph, you can clearly see that from 2010 to 2019. It has introduced numerous products, uh, especially this is at the software side, wherein, you know, uh, it, which will help in the diffusion. Uh, people can use any product that suits them. For example, the IEM, IMPS, which is quite you know, quite uh, popular these days. Then it has or the AEPS, the Aadhaar based system. Then uh, in NPC also introduced the Rupee card, which is actually a competitor to the Visa and MasterCard. It has introduced that. And of course, the blockbuster or the biggest disruptor, the UPI, the United uh, Unified Payment Interface, which is remarkable for its the simplicity of its construction, and it allows for person-to-person -person or person-to-merchant transaction without even sharing full bank account details on a real-time basis. And all this can be done through a mobile, 365 days in a year and 24 cross seven. So no wonder. UPI is such a robust you know, and simple technology that it's now being exported to other countries. So as we can see, at this software part, we have been, you know, we have had some phenomenal successes, UPI being one of the key examples. However, if one comes to the hardware part in the technology and knowledge domain, the physical infrastructure, uh, one thing which is clearly apparent is the unequal access to high-speed internet which is there across the country. And most of us and most of the access is through mobiles. Most of the access to internet is through mobiles. And the internet speed in the country uh, is uh, among the lowest. As a result of which, you know, many of us would have had this experience where many of the, our money gets debited, but the transaction gets truncated. And it takes around five to seven working days for the money to come back to your account. So as a result of this, there is hesitancy among many users to uh, continue using the digital, digital payments. And of course, there's also this perceived cyber security threat, which again holds back many users. So that's something uh, that we need to uh, needs to be worked on in the sector system of innovation. Another important hardware that's uh, very important, especially with respect to the card payment, is the availability of the point of sale machines. Uh, the point of sale machines, you know, currently there are around 4.7 million machines that are being used by around 1 million merchants in the in in the country. Uh, it's we have, we have seen and we write we show it in the paper that the growth rate of the uh, POS machines in the country has been slowing. For example, in 2016-17, the demonetization year, the the growth rate of the point of sale machine, you know, the uh, the amount number of point of sale machines available across the country was the growth rate was 82.5 percent, whereas in 2021 it's just 6.45 percent, or in other words. Uh, the the growth at which uh, the growth rate of POS machines in the country has declined. Uh, the, this huge import during the demonetization year was probably, you know, due to the encouraging the government encouraging digital payments for which, you know, for to make it accessible to get more card machines, imports were facilitated, uh, and because of which, lots of POS were uh, imported. And one also has to mention at this point of time that a majority of the hardware that is required for the digital ecosystems, like mobile phones, uh, payment and POS machines are not produced in India, which increases our import bill. So thus it's probable or one can hypothesize that, you know, a policy where we encourage digital payments to importing these kind of machines, you know, is not beneficial or is at, at cross purposes with our other policy, government policies just make in India. So in that sense, probably we can have more uh, coordination among policies so that one can help the other. Another reason why probably, you know, there's slower adoption of POS machines is cost. Cost is a very important element, uh, especially when it comes to the smaller shops, which probably is also one of the reasons for the slowing growth rate. And there is also this merchant discount rate. For example, for every transaction that is done on a POS machine, uh, the merchant is uh, charged a commission by the bank. And if uh, there is always a need to find an optimal merchant discount rate, the government, you know, gave it thrust in this when it, you know, just after demonetization, when it, you know, through its oil marketing companies, it asked them to bear the MDR for the car transaction done at petrol pumps. 
so and it also asked the uh, oil marketing companies to give a 0.75 percent discount on card payments for fuel purchases and it was it has been seen that as a result of these kind of uh, you know incentives post demonetization uh, the monthly share of digital payments for fuel purchases at petrol pumps doubled to almost 40 percent so in, in that sense there is a need uh, to find the optimal merchant discount rate so that the availability of POS machine increases and the infrastructure improves. So coming to the third and probably the most important pillar in the sector system of innovation, which is demand. And Professor Mary has already you know, stressed on the importance about how important demand is to you know for the innovation to diffuse across the economy. So here uh, to, to proxy for demand, we use income growth. And for uh, to proxy for that, we are we are using the rate of growth of real per capita GDP. And as you can see in this graph, uh, the the rate the, uh, the rate of growth of uh, rate of growth for the real per capita GDP increased from 4.2 percent to 6.9 percent between 2012-13 to 2016-17. So basically, demand. So we can assume or presume that demand probably for digital products would have increased. However, post 2016-17, we can see it's plummeted. It's declining. So, which obviously will affect the demand for digital payment uh, payment services, which uh, in effect, you know, probably it's reflected in the declining trends that Professor Mani has discussed. And what this income growth uh, graph is also seconded by a World Bank report that says that unemployment has been increasing during this period between 2016-17 uh, till 2019-20. So, of course, one. Uh, in passing, I need also to mention that during this time, the government has all the banks have also uh, lowered the cost of transfer, which has been an important factor to for increase in the growth of say RTGS, NEFT, and IMPS. So, and of course, the PSOs, uh, the prepaid instruments also have come up with innovative marketing schemes like cashback offers, both at the customer and merchant side, which has helped them gain popularity and increase demand. But however, the in the demand could have further multiplied had this income growth been in a, shown a very uh, increasing trend throughout the whole period. So just to you know, uh, get some uh, empirical, empirical justification for, uh, for the, uh, especially the sec uh, two building blocks of the sectoral system of innovation, we do this very simple, uh, simple positive, very simple relation, wherein Y DMT is the uh, monthly growth rate of digital payments. And we posit that it's a function of the cost of cash. In this case, we uh, proxy cost of cash, you know, as the currency and circulation. The logic being that for the higher the currency and circulation, more the easier access to cash, hence, hence lower the cost of cash. So, so in that sense, we are proxying currency and circulation, which we all have experienced during the demonetization, demonetization period where getting currency was much more difficult. So we obviously prefer digital moments, digital payment products. The to proxy for the cost of digital payments, we use three uh, uh, variables. One is the tele density per hundred population. More the number of mobile phones in the in the system or in the in the population, for easier the access for digital products. And uh, if a consumer wants, they can use mobile phones for digital payments. Uh, we wanted to proxy the uh, increase in bank, monthly increase in bank accounts, uh, but we could not get proper data for a monthly increase in bank account. So what we did for that, we actually use the outstanding card volume as a proxy. So higher the card volume, in, uh, in, again, easier the access towards the digital payment ecosystem. And finally, we also use the number of POS terminals monthly just to proxy for the card payment network. So the, so this, we would have allowed to have a digital a demand variable here, but because of, because as you can see, we are doing it for monthly from April 2011 to October 2019. Because after October 2019, RBI has changed the way it's reporting the monthly data because of which we could not we could not map the data properly. Hence, we had just stopped it at October 2019. But having said that, uh, we could not get any demand variable uh, because of which we stop at uh, 2019, and we were allowed to put the demand variable in this equation just to look at how demand has uh, affected the rate of growth. And because we had this demonetization in 2016, we were also were interested in, in looking at for any structural break. So now uh, this is just to quickly go to the summary statistics. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have the April to November 2016 uh, values. And for the second period, December 2016 to October 2019, you can clearly see that uh, we have used the digital payments volume monthly growth rate. 
uh, on comparing the means on both sides, you can clearly see that the means of uh, uh, in the second period are much higher than those in the uh, first period. So this uh, obviously, as we all know, after demonetization, the government emphasized more of digital payments and the whole uh, building blocks got some further push because of which uh, everything, you know, the path for digital payments became easier. So we expect some kind of a empirical support for our this. So these are the estimation results. You can clear. So what does what can one see? We can see in the in the pre demonetization period, you can see that as the currency in circulation is increasing, the rate of growth of digital payments is falling. Whereas we are not, and it's it's significant at one person level. Uh, whereas this at the in the post demonetization period is is not significant though the t value is quite close but it's it's not significant. Whereas for tele density it's uh, insignificant for both the periods. Whereas for card volumes you can see that though it's insignificant in the pre demonetization period it's significant in the post and it's positive and significant in the post demonetization period. Similarly for the number of POS machines. So what uh, the way we would like to you know, probably. Understand this is that as as I just mentioned the the whole um, government uh, machinery you know uh, emphasized or supported the, uh, the the building blocks for sector especially the infrastructure uh, and the bank networks or the increasing accounts because of which uh, the SSI got a fillip at least these two building blocks got a fillip which is being reflected in the positive and significant uh, variables in the estimation results and also what you can see is that the chow test the structural change is no the null hypothesis of no structural change is rejected or in uh, other words there is a structural break so if you would like to clarify here that uh, we are by this we do not imply that uh, it's not demonetization has not been a temporary shock demonetization we still believe has been a temporary shock but as we all know once the, the demonetization, demonetization shock initially was emphasized uh, the main aim was removing black money but after a few weeks uh, the aim became promoting digital payments and the whole government machine supported that so our argument would be that post demonetization because the support uh, supporting activities uh, you know strengthen the structural system of innovation particularly the first two building blocks you can see that there's some empirical justification for that and so now to conclude probably i will request professor money to uh, Come and conclude. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Chidabram. I think uh, uh, you know diffusion is basically an ongoing phenomenon. We have just taken a slice of time from 2010 to 20, 2021, and it's uh, perhaps bound to increase in the future, given the strong policy thrust and uh, and possibility of uh, the economy growing faster. Because if the demand is going to pick up, and if more people are going to have sufficient incomes in their hands then perhaps some more digital, digital transactions will be resorted to, especially when both the fiscal and monetary authorities are incentivizing that system. Now, temporary shocks of demonetization and the pandemic have not really helped in hastening the process of diffusion. Of course, as uh, um, uh, Chidamram just said, uh, two blocks of the uh, sectoral system of innovation may have received some support uh, because of demonetization. And uh, although the original purpose of demonetization was not to increase digital payments, rather to, con uh, to uh, do away with the black money and unaccounted incomes. Later on, the narrative changed to digital payments. And in that process, the government put in place all kinds of things to encourage uh, digital payments. So it may have actually helped two of those building blocks, but the demand, it clearly did not. And so there is a, uh, while a clearly a de demonstrated success has been achieved uh, uh, in those two building blocks, uh, those affecting demand has uh, overtaken the supply side building blocks, and as a result, the rate of growth of digital payments have not been high. It has been going down over a, a period. So this is an uh, uh, instance where the impact of level of economic activity dominates the technology substitution effect. You have these two technologies, cash-based and uh, digital-based, but uh, and one is substituting one for the other. And this has been overtaken essentially by the level of economic activity, you know, and you can see this in other uh, new technologies as well. And uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, if you look at the adoption of uh, certain kinds of manufacturing, high tech manufacturing technologies at the plant level, that also seems to have had the same kind of effect when the economic, uh, the economy is not doing well, the diffusion rates actually go, they go down. 
So government policies must strengthen all the three building blocks, not just only two of them as it has done in the past. And only then uh, the new innovation will diffuse widely. This is all we have to say, and then uh, thank you so much for your patience. Over to, over to the moderator now. Thank you. Thank you for a very exciting talk. So the digital floor is open to the audience for questions. So while questions come in, I have uh, one question, which is that you know I I could uh, understand uh, the reasoning behind uh, the claims uh, made in the paper, and the uh, empirical evidence is uh, also persuasive. So it is my question is kind of uh, you know tangentially related. It's not directly on the point. But it is uh, really intriguing why the currency in circulation index uh, has surpassed the pre-COVID levels. You know, if it came back uh, to the previous levels or very close to it, uh, one will still understand. Do you have a sense of why it has uh, surpassed even the pre-COVID levels? That's a little surprising. Uh, you need to unmute, uh, Professor Manish. Uh, maybe take a few questions and then we answer all of them together. Right. Okay. Madhura has a question. Madhura. Uh, actually, I, I found it fascinating because uh, this is all sort of quite new to me. And what you're saying is very, uh, you know, persuasive. Uh, so the comment really is that I, I mean, 1 comment and quick question comment is that uh, what the economic survey has proposed is again, a real, you know, supply side push. In terms of uh, infrastructure for uh, internet as well, 5G and various other things and, you know, so many digital things were mentioned yesterday. Uh, but in terms of the demand side of the economy, I think that's. I mean, a lot of economists have agreed that uh, the whole push to get hands into the people, you know. Um, income into the hands of the those who have lost jobs, etc. Uh, there's been a real uh, sort of negative, um, you know, disheartening uh, budget on that account. Uh, my question really is that: Is there? Uh, I don't know this data at all. So, do we have data for urban, rural, or any type of state level disaggregation where some of these factors may, you know, you may be able to explore even more? Um, because I'm sure that the rural uh, and a lot of the parameters uh, is going to be very different. And do we see your factors, you know, playing out in the same way? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think hey, Gogol, hey. Gogol has uh, something and Murugan has. So can I ask? I'm Gogol. Yes, please. Huh. I was wondering, uh, uh, no, it was very interesting uh, presentation. It was just I was curious about the fact that the downward uh, trends that you have about the rate of growth is can it be because of very strong base effect in the beginning of your period? Because if we if we look at if we remove the uh, 2021 or the pandemic period, even that was the end. Also, growth rates are fairly high. If I'm not wrong, six percent. These are high growth rates. No, so. If it is the strong base effect of the initial years, that's driving the downward downward trend. Okay. So maybe you could uh, take these three questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, so we have had three questions from Ram, Professor Ram Singh, uh, Professor Madhira Samnadar, and uh, Dr. Gugol. Uh, and uh, Ram, Professor Ram Singh has actually asked why the currency in circulation index has gone to. Uh, in the post COVID levels have even surpassed the pre COVID levels, you know, and, uh, I, I actually, I do not have a, a, a explanation for that. In fact, that has been surprising, you know, in fact, the whole data has been counterintuitive for us because we uh, thought that cash as a means of transaction would have come, come down. But, uh, uh, as the world pay document is also the global payment report is also showing that India is still cash based, you know, a large amount of uh, transactions are still cash based. 
uh, you, you know, is something. And people have now almost like uh, on a feverish pace, you know, almost like a vengeance gone back to cash, you know, and, and deliberately not using. In fact, uh, 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 and this may be, I, I, I really do not have, I think this is an area for the, uh, someone to look at, you know, we really do not have a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation as to why it has, because it's counterintuitive, you know. So we are only just presenting the results and uh, 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 only one thing, because normally, um, you know, there is a certain amount of cash transactions given certain amount of economic activity, but we know that the economic activity during this period has also been going down. Okay. And uh, so that's that's even more surprising, you know. And uh, so I I don't unfortunately I don't have a proper explanation for that one. Now for Madhurya Swamnathan's question, um, you know about demand, uh, and she specifically referred to the union budget which was presented yesterday, where uh, you know demand stimulation doesn't seem to have happened uh, that much. But of course, uh, uh, you know, as a devil's advocate, if I look at from the point of view of the government, I'm sorry to be equating uh, the government with devil, but <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, uh, the government would say that the large infrastructure push that has been given, 35% increase in capital expenditures, you know, and, and this is basically road building, etc., and so on, and uh, and uh, roads construction for construction activity, for instance, can put money into people's hands, different. Uh, and not only those people who are actually employed to construct the roads, but also all kinds of equipments and, uh, you know, stones and cement and other things which are being also materials which are used. So the government is actually thinking about a demand stimulation through that process. But as Nagaraj has actually argued in the, for instance, in this morning's paper, uh, that also may have been a little difficult because what you find is that construction technology over a period of time like in, uh, in the case of manufacturing technology is also getting automated. More machines are being used rather than when it's becoming less labor intensive. So uh, whether that would, uh, uh, this huge capital expenditure through its multiplier effects, you know, uh, uh, whether that would uh, uh, drive demand uh, is an empirical question, you know, and, uh, and the government's assumption is that it would, because it, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, uh, both backward and forward linkages, because it is not just the construction of the road, but once the road comes into existence, lot of economic activity will start on either side of the road, uh, and and we have seen this all over the place, you know, and uh, uh, and and roads will spur a fair amount of economic activity, which will lead to more demands being created. So this is basically an empirical question. Okay. And uh, now coming to Google's point about whether the downward trend is basically a strong base effect. Uh, uh, yes, it is in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, you know, unified payment interface, uh, this can be a base effect because it started in 2016 only, and you had a, a very small amount of transactions done in, in the initial period. So you have a very high rate of growth, about 5,000 something, something of that sort. Then after that, it, it has come down. But what we are seeing is that the, the decline is every year. It is not uh, coming down and then increasing, but it's a uh, decline is every year. And other forms of payment, for instance, RTGS, NEFT, etc., that also has declined. You know, so there there is no base effect as such. So base effect can only be there in uh, UPI and not in the other major forms of uh, digital payment. Uh, you know, indicators. So that would be my answer to Google. Thank you. Let's take the next round. So, question from Dr. Morgan, followed by Professor Sen. And then we have a question from Sanjay. We will go in this order. Okay. Dr. Morgan. Pardon? Morgan, you can. Yeah. Can I? I have a little, little clarification only. It's not a question or no, but it's an excellent paper, no doubt. It's an attempt which is quite remarkable. Now, the question is, you are talking of diffusion primarily. So when we are talking of diffusion, you are taking two measures, volume and value of transactions. But which one could be an indicator in precise as the indicator of diffusion per se? 
Why I'm asking is your uh, value of transactions, uh, there can have more and more numbers. So, but volume also, when the number of transactions goes up, the numbers of, or rather, uh, it has to be netted out. So, in which way you would measure that diffusion per se as the measure for diffusing the technology? That is one thing. Second thing is that there is a shrinkage effect at the fag end. So, to my knowledge, once it is diffused, means there cannot have a, you know, growth rate can come down, no doubt, because their growth rate might have come down also, but the diffusion will still remain as diffusion itself. It cannot go down at all. That is second thing. And uh, one more thing which I would like to like to discuss is the how will you adjust alternate measures of payments? Because digital payments are there are several forms of digital payments which you yourself have uh, pointed out in your uh, paper and uh, all that. But one form of payment and the other form of payment, how will you adjust in your diffusion index? Because diffusion different diffusion of different technologies. Uh, you know, each individual meticulous technology is you are going, or will you be going to the diffusion as such? So these are the three doubts which uh, I am having. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So Professor Sen, Professor Chiranjeev Sen, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Uh... I just wanted to. Uh, it's a matter of clarification only. Uh, I was not hundred percent. There, I came in and out, but some basic questions uh, struck me. See, one question was, I'm not sure how you're dealing with uh, other kinds of transactions. For example, transactions by check, demand draft, because many of the large volume transactions in the system will be there. And from, the, from what I heard, it looked like cash versus digital, but this other large, the M1 is defined also with checking account. No, one could look at this whole thing in terms of different ratios as you define the money supply separately. Because if you really want to know whether the culture of this thing is you know, taking place, you need to understand what proportion of the transactions are getting done through what. That's one thought. And the other thought was that is it not possible to push a little harder and and see uh, where it is where the, uh, the digital thing is happening more. For example, if you look at the size, you must have done it, right? The, the size of transactions, if you take the ratio of digital payments in small size transactions vis-a-vis -vis large transactions. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you know, if businesses are doing it or or rich people are doing it and so on and so forth, you can see how it's moving. Because this will enable us to understand uh, across income levels, roughly speaking, what the kind of acceptance is, whether mm -hmm. poor people are doing it, middle class people are doing more, etc. And that could be proxied by the size of the transaction. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I, you may have looked at it. They just took clarification. They just struck me when I uh, the, uh, yeah. heard. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, shall we answer this or uh, we go to the other people also? Maybe we'll go to the other people also and. Uh... Yeah, we can. Uh, let's take one more question. Yeah. Maybe. maybe uh, who's next? Professor Harilal, I think. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, in fact, no, it's not a question. I'm also seeking a kind of clarification. Yeah. That's about uh, currency in uh, circulation. Can we equate currency in circulation with uh, transactions in currency? Because you know, this period is known for printing of currency world over. In most countries, in the United States, in Europe, and even in India, you know, this was a period of uh, machines continuously working producing more and more currency. So this uh, availability of currency may not be a right in, uh, kind of uh, indicator for transactions in currency notes. So, uh, you know, in fact, no, Professor Ram Singh was also uh, probably uh, asking this question, but this is something worth pursuing. That's what I 
I, I thought. But uh, in any case, you know, this was a very interesting paper, very timely. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Sanjay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I really like your presentation. It's as usual. I like your presentation. So I have a one small question. In fact, it is not a, it is a kind of clarification only. So, uh, since you are using the sectoral system of innovation to explain the uh, factors behind the low diffusion rate, uh, so uh, I uh, and also uh, you have also focusing upon the demand aspect that uh, income growth also that also affect the low income growth that affect the diffusion rate. But uh, but finally you are resorting to the that regression analysis. But uh, what I understood about sectoral system innovation and you know that better than me. So, but uh, that uh, that sectoral system innovation is very much interactive in nature, sir. So, but uh, using regression analysis, and again, you are not including this demand factor, demand yeah. variable, and uh, how you are going to that uh, that analysis cannot. I, I would suggest that it should not be used to you know, you know, conclude the thing. That is yes. the only thing I have, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think these are all very good and um, uh, very good and uh, uh, you know uh, logical uh, clarificatory questions. Starting with Murugan, uh, diffusion rate. See, when you talk about diffusion rate, I could write right in the beginning. I said, what is the ideal rate of diffusion? You know, uh, you look at a new technology and you find out the number of actors who have adopted that new technology and then take that as a percentage of the total number of actors who could have adopted that technology. Okay. And this, of course, as you said, will uh, be maybe very low right at the beginning because of a whole lot of uh, informational problems, the cost of switching from the old to the new technology, availability of substitutes, etc., and so on. And then as uh, uh, more information and when the cost of acquisition and the benefits of acquiring that new technology is understood, uh, uh, you know, the diffusion rates will rise faster. And then after everyone who could have possibly adopted that, who, who have, it's almost like an epidemic, you know, like our uh, uh, current epidemic, you know, uh, where you have a herd immunity and then you know, there is no one else who could be infected further. So the in fact, rate of infection could be uh, something similar to the rate of uh, diffusion. But unfortunately, we do not have that kind of data to measure the diffusion rate as far as uh, uh, digital payments is concerned. And as I mentioned to you, the National Payments Corporation's attempt to do that in 2020 by doing a household survey is highly uh, what's a suspect, if I may use the term, uh, because uh, they have a Household survey of 5,300 households out of a sampling frame of 35,000, which means about a realized sample or, or, a, or a response rate of about 15%. Okay, they don't tell you how they have divided this. This is uh, uh, again taking up Chen Chip's uh, point about different size classes. They don't tell us about how they divided the uh, different size classes. And what is interesting, they, they divide them into bottom 40%, middle 40%, top 20%. Now, the average income of the bottom 40% per year is 1,10,000. The average income of the middle 40% per year is 1,30,000. And the average income of the top 20% is 3,20,000. And that sounds very, I mean, if, uh, uh, I must say that, uh, uh, I mean, if I'm a rich person and my average income is only uh, 3.2 uh, lakhs per year, you know, I mean, I, I, I find it extremely strange. Okay. So uh, we really do not have that kind of data to, uh, to measure the rate of uh, diffusion. Now, the proxy that we have used is both volume and value. It is not either of the two. Okay. Both. And we have actually showed that in both volume and value, the rate of growth have plummeted. You know, not only at the aggregate level, but almost all components of it uh, of uh, diffusion uh, of uh, digital payments. So it's not only in one particular uh, transaction that this has actually uh, happened, but in all kinds of 
uh, digital transactions, uh, this uh, reduction has happened. Okay, it has happened in RTGS, it has happened in uh, uh, NEFT, it has happened in uh, card payments, it has happened in UPI also. Okay, although as Bhagavad said, UPI that can be a base effect which can explain, but not in the other uh, other uh, forms because they were in existence for a very long period of time. Okay, it's just that they have become much more easy to use, and uh, because of both hardware and software uh, changes. For instance, when internet uh, uh, is more diffused, more people can uh, do digital transactions, etc. And so. Now, uh, change its point about transactions by checks and draft. This is not included because this is paper based. Okay, this is not considered to be digital transactions. And in fact, even the check truncation and MICR based where you uh, banks take a photograph of your uh, check and then, you know, you clear it. And because of the core banking, you know, you, you, you have now a situation where you go with a check to the branch of uh, uh, any branch of that same bank, you can encash your check. This was not possible earlier because of this uh, check truncation and uh, MICR uh, facility. But that is not considered to be digital payments according to RBI. We have strictly used the RBI definition of digital payments. And as I said, they were including this uh, uh, check payments and uh, uh, draft payments, etc., as uh, digital payments in uh, uh, in the year up to 2016-17, and after that, they are not included. Okay, so that's the answer to Kirinchip's uh, uh, point. Size class-wise data, you really do not have. What you have is only the total value of uh, uh, transactions. Now, uh, uh, Harilat's point about currency in circulations, and uh, 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 whether you can take that as a proxy for transactions in currency notes, yes. We are taking that as a uh, because that is the internationally accepted proxy that is used. Okay, because you do not uh, you do not have direct data on how much of uh, currencies are uh, uh, are used in transactions and how much of currency uh, digital I mean digital payments you have, but how much of of the total amount of transactions which are taking place in the economy, how much of cash is. Or, or what is the share of cash? We don't have that data. What we have is instead only currency in circulation. Although that world pay report that I talked about, the global pay report, uh, global payments report, that does measure the total amount of transactions. Okay, but I don't know how they have uh, uh, arrived at the total amount of transactions because you know uh, 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 there is a fair amount of double counting in all these. And in the same transaction, some part of the transaction can be digital, some trans, uh, part of the transaction can be cash based, etc. And so on. So there are huge problems there. Now, uh, Sanjay Malik's point about uh, the regression equation, and uh, I think I would let uh, Ch Chidambaram uh, to answer that point. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Mani. Yeah. See, uh, thank you for your questions. The, uh, we do agree that SSI is uh, interactive. But the whole attempt, see, uh, the outcome of the building blocks is if the, if the SSI functions strongly, the outcome we are trying to capture, see, the number of PS machines, the, uh, the stronger the SSI building block, the number of POS machines should be higher. So in that sense, we are saying, we are trying, It's of course, it's a, it's a novel attempt, but we are trying to conceptualize in that sense. The inter we are not trying to measure the interactivity, but we are just trying to look at them as the outcome variables of the strength of the SSI. So if the SSI is strong, the number of POS machines will be higher, available will be higher. If the SSI is strong, the number of accounts that are getting opened will be higher. So in that sense, we are trying to capture the essence of the SSI. So that's the whole attempt. Okay. So that's that's all I can, you know. So in that way, we are trying to you know conceptualize the whole empirical strategy. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, this is uh this was the last round, unless uh, somebody has a pressing question to ask. We have had very engaging seminar today, this afternoon. I thank you all for actively participating in the Q&A session. And uh, all the compliments go to the two speakers, Professor Mani and Dr. Ayer. So this is a really fascinating work. 
Uh, from the questions, it is also clear that you know there's a uh, more that you can um, add to your work, but it's already very interesting work with interesting policy implications. I have uh, one quick comment and uh, follow up uh, point related to what Professor Sen uh, mentioned. You know, one of uh, the issues of public policy interest would be to study what for what kind of transactions uh, the digital payments are used more intensely compared to the others. Because one concern we have for our country is, uh, you know, people engage using cash to invest, to engage in quasi legal transactions or using cash based transactions to evade tax. So from that viewpoint, it will be of interest to know where digital transactions uh, payments are being used more frequently. And of course, uh, the geographical rural urban spread will also be of uh, interest. But thank you, thank you for this, uh, for uh, sharing with us. It's very fascinating results coming from your research. Thank you. Thank you very much. You need to unmute, uh, Professor Manning. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Pro Professor Ram Singh, and thank you all for your comments. I think one student, Vaitik, had a question. Maybe he can ask me uh, on Ch Chidambaram after the seminar, because now that the chairman has uh, completed the... Sorry, I missed. I didn't see. I thought I had taken all the questions with raised hands, but yeah. sorry uh, if I missed. Thank you, Professor Ram Singh. Thank please you take much. your question directly to the authors. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Professor Ram Singh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, have a very good evening. Okay. It was Thank a pleasure you. to take part in this event. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.